just make a couple reminders on this first vote that will also apply to the second vote. Uh, first of all, they will put, be put to you in a form of a question. These questions are debatable. Uh, they will require a two-thirds majority vote. A motion to reconsider is never in order. Beyond that, the regular rules of debate will apply. Also remind the members that we have a court reporter. Uh, when we do the voice vote, we need you to, uh, to speak up. Okay? We will get started. On Article 1, the question before the Senate is, shall the Senate sustain the first article of impeachment, crimes causing the deaths of Joseph Beaver against Attorney General Jason Roundsburg and remove him from the office of Attorney General? Are there any remarks? Correct. Senator Schoenbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the body, every day in South Dakota, Somewhere, our friends, our family, our neighbors are highly likely to be out walking somewhere on a road. It's not an unusual event. In the summer, we probably have tourists, flat tire, out of gas, any number of things. Could be Highway 12, 212, 81, 50, it doesn't matter. Picture that person that you know walking where they're supposed to be along the road like hundreds if not thousands of South Dakotans do every year. Now picture a vehicle coming at them at highway speeds. And this vehicle has had its first set of tires on the side go over the fog line, then the rumble strips, which make a hell of a lot of noise, then the other two tires, they've crossed the fog line, now they've crossed the rumble strips, and they're bearing down on that family or friend or neighbor that you know, and they smash them at highway speeds, accelerating their body to the highway speed that the car's accelerating to, so hard they put the face through the windshield so the driver of this vehicle could actually reach over and touch that face. And if the defense is, I was not a distracted driver, then there's a way, way bigger, way, way bigger set of facts here we should be thinking about because that means this person, this person ran down that family, friend, or neighbor at highway speeds, seeing them right in front of them, put their head through the windshield. They were on the vehicle for a couple of seconds before the body rolls off and says, I hit something. Well, that was a lie. There is no question that was a lie. There's no question that this person ran down an innocent South Dakotan, ran them down. And we do not have to leave our decisions about crimes to the charging decisions of the deputy state's attorney for Hyde County. We don't have to. If we think that's criminal conduct, then it is criminal conduct for purposes of the Constitution. There are some other statements that have been made here. Um, there is no such thing as a burden of proof. And every one of you knows that because we make a couple thousand votes a year. And we don't sit down and say, ah, beyond a reasonable doubt, clear and convincing, okay, I'll vote for that water bill or I won't. It doesn't work that way. What we do is what we, the instructions or the statements that have been shared with all of you, that each senator should make the decision on the impeachment question based upon how they view the evidence in the performance of their duties as a state senator with regard to the oath of office they took to perform those duties, this is neither a criminal or a civil legal proceeding. It is exactly what you do with every single decision you have made every year and every day you've been in this body. There's no such thing as a burden of proof. So this discussion about clear and convincing, that's all made up. That's all made up. And here's another interesting thing. There is no such thing as a right against self-incrimination in this proceeding. That's a criminal concept. So the Attorney General, if he was going to, as the phrase, I didn't write it down, but vigorously defend or something, there's a mic right there. And that's a damn short walk. And somebody could have got up there and told us why the heck, if he wasn't a distracted driver, why he ran down a South Dakota city at highway speeds and put their head through his windshield and then lied about it. 
He had no right against self-incrimination. He chose, he chose not to be here to share with us what the hell he was doing killing that person. The, uh, the issues about the tires off the road, th those are science. The, uh, the standards used by the National Highway Traffic Safety Institute to reconstruct, that's not guesswork, that's not magic. The law enforcement officers had no reason to make any of this up. The, uh, we'll talk about malfeasance with the next one, but this one as to criminal conduct. If this was anybody besides the Attorney General that did that to your neighbor, your family, your friend, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Why this is dragged out, why we're even having this trial is beyond me. This, this is only because of the sordid political agendas other folks have. This, there should have been a resignation a long time ago. There should have been contrition that hasn't happened, and there should be impeachment. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Heinert. Let me talk up you, Mr. President. Senators, we were tasked with, it seems like, an impossible task. It's never happened in the state before. Nobody wanted to be here. The Attorney General doesn't want to be here. We don't want to be here. The family of Joseph Beaver doesn't want to be here. But here we are. We were told that this isn't a criminal or a civil trial. So I'm not an attorney. I know a few members of our body, they are. So how do I reconcile all of this information that we've received? And it comes down to, what do you believe? Do you believe the actions that the Attorney General took prior to that accident and after warrant his removal from office? Now, I looked at the data, and I was, I was extremely disheartened when I saw some of those pictures and when I, when I read the reports. That man laid out there for almost a day. And in our way, you cannot go on your journey when that happens. With all of these proceedings happening right now, he still cannot go. So he's waiting for us to finish this. There was something that really struck me as uh, we have went through this. I'm going to pause right now. That's how long it took for the time that he struck Mr. Beaver to stop his car. 18 seconds. He went over a football field and a half before he stopped. So what do I believe? Why did it take so long? Why was he so far down the road? What I believe is he knew. He knew that something terrible happened and he was going to have to answer for it and he panicked. And he thought, maybe if I get far enough down the road, they won't see what's laying in the ditch back here. And it worked. Worked the whole night. So if I believe that, then I have to look at what else was done. And from everything I've read, everything I've seen, and what I believe, I have to sustain this article of impeachment. Ask yourself if you believe it too.
Jalama Atwa. Further remarks? Mr. President. Senator Kamak. Mr. President, every day in South Dakota, there are folks that drive out outside the lane of traffic. But in this instance, we've got the science says that, that very likely there were four wheels outside across that fog line, four wheels that had crossed a rumble strip. Anybody that's crossed a rumble strip, you can, even if you're not in the car, you can hear it forever. And all, you they crossed the rumble strip twice and ended up in the taking of a human life. In the end, regardless of the outcome of these questions, there will be no winners. It's not possible. But I ask that you vote yes on the question. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Rush. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, my fellow senators, my friends here after eight years in this body, I never imagined in those eight years that I would approach this uh, on this kind of an issue uh, regarding the impeachment of an, another person that I had regarded as my friend for, for many years. I think I've probably known the Attorney General longer than, than anyone else here. He started practicing in my court in Yankton when he first got out of law school. He appeared in my court numerous times. And, you know, I have difficulty reconciling the young man and the, the maturing man that I knew there in my court with a lot of the testimony here today. Um, based on my personal experiences with him, I don't believe that he would get up here and deliberately about these, lie about these issues. But the fact that he isn't lying doesn't mean that his recollection about what happened is necessarily accurate. You know, that's one thing that I learned in many, many years in the courtroom is that people can tell absolutely what they think is the truth and it's, it's not the truth because they recollect things differently. You know, I don't think there's any evidence uh, to support uh, the claim by his cousin that he committed suicide by throwing himself in front of the car. I don't think there's any evidence to support a claim by his other cousin that this is some kind of a gigantic cover-up uh, because he's an elected official. You know, if that was true, uh, we wouldn't be here today. You know, I'm impressed with the investigation that the North Dakota BCI did. I think they did an absolutely thorough investigation and followed up on every possible lead that they could. You know, the issue addressed by the House Investigating Committee that he can't be impeached because this was not part of his official office duties as Attorney General is inaccurate in my opinion. Uh, he identified himself as the Attorney General he consulted with the Attorney General's office staff about how to proceed in this matter. Uh, he consulted with the head of the Division of Criminal Investigation about this matter. He considered, consulted with the Attorney General's office chief of staff. He consulted with different DCI experts about the cell phone and, and polygraph. He put out a press release on AG's office stationery. You know, regretfully, I think that the actions that he took after the accident converted this into something involving, directly involving the Attorney General's office in the entire matter. And a result of that, this was treated differently than your ordinary vehicular homicide case. The decision what to charge him with was made by a committee of prosecutors. He was allowed to plead to two class two misdemeanors. And just as an aside, I was one of the substitute justices that sat on the Bill Janklow case. Bill Janklow in a similar case, although I would have to say much more egregious, was convicted of second degree manslaughter. 
for that, and he served his sentence on that. He was, of course, a federal officer at that time, not subject to impeachment. But the prosecutor there made the decision to go ahead and try the case and left the decision to a jury of Moody County uh, jurors. And uh, that didn't happen in this case. In this case, the case was plea bargained away to a couple of uh, class two misdemeanors, and that's not our decision. Uh, we're bound by that decision. Um, you know, I spent a dozen years as a prosecutor. Uh, I'm adamant about the, the powers and the rights of a prosecutor. Uh, and we don't have a right to second guess those, those charging decisions. But, you know, we certainly have a right to think about whether it should have been plea bargained down to that level. In preparation for this hearing, I don't want to call it a trial, this impeachment hearing. I got a book about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, which is, of course, the most important impeachment that we've had in the United States. And if I could just read a paragraph or so here. Uh, so in 1868, Congress and the public would have to consider the definition of a high crime and the meaning of a misdemeanor. It was bewildering. The multitude of strangers were waiting for impeachment, Mark Twain observed. They did not know what impeachment was exactly, but they had a general idea that it would come in the form of an avalanche or a thunderclap or that maybe the roof would fall in. For no, no one knew what the first ever impeachment of the President of the United States would look like or what sufficient grounds, legal or otherwise, were necessary. No one knew, partly because the U.S. Constitution provides few guidelines about impeachment beyond stipulating in Article 2, Section 4, that a federal officer can be impeached for treason, bribery, or a high crime or misdemeanor. The President, if the President of the United States was to be impeached for treason, bribery, or a high crime or, or misdemeanor, then the country had to define high crime. Originally, the crime warranting impeachment was maladministration, but James Madison had objected as the term was too hazy. Yet high crimes and misdemeanors is felt fuzzy too. Um, Alexander Hamilton clarified, sort of, a high crime is an abuse of executive authority proceeding from an abuse or violation of sub-public trust. Impeachment is a national inquest into the conduct of public men. Fuzzy again. Are impeachments to proceed because of violations of law or infraction, infractions against that mur murky thing called public trust? But surely, if the only crimes that were impeachable were high, high, were high then the founders must have met high misdemeanors as well. For a misdemeanor is a legal offense, ranked below that of a felony. Could a president be impeached for any misdemeanor, like stealing a chicken, or did it have to be something well higher? And don't want in any way to indicate that the death of a human being is equivalent to stealing a chicken. But in this case, the misdemeanors that were charged were equivalent to that. What really troubles me about these proceedings is I don't know what happened here. I'm troubled by that. Uh, it's clear that Attorney General Roundsburg has a long history of being a poor driver. He doesn't pay attention when he drives, and it was his plan that night that he wasn't going to pay attention because he was going to be thinking about upcoming cases. How fast was he driving? Was he using his cell phone when he hit Mr. Beaver? How did he get on the shoulder of the highway? No explanation of why he didn't see Mr. Beaver walking along the road with a flashlight. No satisfactory explanation about why he didn't see Mr. Beaver's face in his windshield. No satisfactory explanation about why he didn't see the body or why the sheriff didn't see the body when they apparently or may have walked right by it. No satisfactory explanation of why the sheriff didn't investigate the lit flashlight when he saw it. But the count one charges that he has been committed of crimes He's only been commit, convicted of a couple of class two misdemeanors, traffic offenses, so do we impeach for class two misdemeanors? And I guess my answer to that is no. And I might have a different answer to that in respect to count two, but my answer in, in count one is that we don't impeach for class two misdemeanors. Thank you.
Further remarks? Senator Castleberry. Thank you, Mr. President. When I was growing up, I went between our two houses, which one was in Rapid Valley and one was in Hill City. And so many times during the week, we would drive back and forth on Highway 16 and Highway 385. And throughout my childhood, we probably hit 10 deer. And I will tell you the one thing that we always did, because it was the humane thing to do, was to stop and ensure that that animal was deceased. And when it was practical, if they were not, my mother would discharge a firearm to ensure that that animal did not suffer. When he thought that he had struck a deer, he called 911 and he stayed. When he knew that he had struck a human, he did not call 911 and he left. There's no question here that this is a tragedy of chance. There were miles and miles of highway where he could have veered off the road. And for whatever reason, destiny has forever intertwined these two people. For Mr. Beaver, it meant the end of his life. And for Mr. Roundsburg, it led to discrepancy after discrepancy to show us what the Attorney General of our state was capable of, which I think is grounds for impeachment. Thank you. Further remarks? President. Senator Johns. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of all the members of the Senate, uh, we send our sincerest condolences to the Joseph Beaver family. Uh, it, it certainly is a tragedy, and it's too bad that we have to be here today, and things could have possibly been uh, different if uh, other charges have been brought in this case. Second, we're not uh, entitled to exercise unbridled discretion in this case. The Constitution's clear. There's only five grounds for which it can impeach. One is, uh, drunkenness doesn't apply crimes, C correct conduct or misfeasance or misdemeanors in office. Crimes here mean felonies. There's no reason why you would say misdemeanors and felony, uh, um, uh, crimes and misdemeanors. It's crimes are limited specifically to felonies. Now the felony that could have been charged and was charged in, in uh, Governor uh, Janklow's case was manslaughter, reckless, recklessly taking the life of another human being. If you look at the elements of Article 1, these, he is not charged with recklessly taking the life of a human being, nor is he even charged with negligently taking the life of another human being. He's charged with lane changing and uh, distracted driving. They're class two misdemeanors. A felony is something you can go to the penitentiary for. A class two misdemeanor is $500 and a uh, or thousand. I, well, no, it's 500 and six months in jail or something now, but it's changed. And then there's a class one misdemeanor. We aren't looking at a class one misdemeanor. We're not looking at a felony. We're looking at two class two misdemeanors that cause the death of another individual. And neither of these relate to any performance of anything that would re be related to his performance in office. Uh, these misdemeanors, as used in the Constitution, must relate specifically to duties of office. They must be integral to that office. And driving while you're coming back from a Lincoln Day dinner, which is an uh, act of a politician, somebody that wants to get elected, it's not a requirement that I go to a Lincoln Day dinner as a attorney general. There's no requirement. That's not one of the things that I'm re required to do as an attorney general. I'm doing that because I want to get reelected. I'm going to all these places and doing a lot of those things, but that's the act of a, of a, 
politician. I'm going to keep my remarks as to the second uh, article since we'll be voting on them separately, but I, I, we, we do need to keep our eye on the ball and we don't have a felony charge here. There was nothing ever alleged in that respect and we are limited to specifically what they said in the article and there's nothing mentioned about a crime that would qualify under our Constitution for this death. And for that reason, I would submit that uh, it's, we must vote um, uh, that the uh, article has not been sustained. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Wheeler. Members of the Senate, as I've been contemplating this matter for a long time, I try and bring myself back to the law, to my, to my duty to do law, to a justice according to law and evidence. That's what our oath is, to do justice according to law and evidence. And so when thinking about this first article, I first have to ask myself, what is the law? The law is that we can only impeach for drunkenness, crimes, corrupt conduct, or malfeasance, or misdemeanors in office. Now, there's been some debate about what crimes mean. There's been an argument made that it only applies to felonies. There was an argument made by the respondents team that it only applies to crimes made in office. I submit to you both of those are wrong. Crimes means crimes. It's a plain word that all of us understand. And any crime you commit can potentially make you liable for impeachment. Now, whether a, any crime rises to the level of impeachment, I'll address a little bit later. But as the definition of crime in general means any crime you commit, because if you believe the respondent's argument that only applies to crimes in office, well then someone could commit murder not related to their office, be convicted and sit in prison, and yet still be an official of the state, because we would have been powerless to remove them. That cannot be. That's an absurd reading of our Constitution. And so I look at this to say we can impeach for any crimes. And so then I now must look to what is the law the House gave to us. The House's duty is to impeach. They submit articles of impeachment. Our question that we are going to answer to today is to sustain that article of impeachment. And so I review what the House sent to us. The House said that they are impeaching Attorney General Jason Roundsburg for crimes causing the death of Joseph Beaver. That is all they specified. Crimes causing the death of Joseph Beaver. Now, they did specify three paragraphs regarding the facts surrounding that, and they mentioned two class two misdemeanors to which he pled no contest. But the impeachment article did not limit us to just those two crimes. The impeachment article applies to any crimes causing the death. So I exclude crimes involving lying to law enforcement. So those didn't result in his death. Those were afterwards. We'll deal with those in count two. But in this case, I'm only looking at what caused his death. And so in this case, I now go to the evidence. The evidence in this case was presented to me by the, all of the investigators who, who were involved clearly that he was off the road. He was off the road by all four tires. Now, I won't get too much into a debate about the burden of proof, except to say I believe it's correct that one doesn't exist. We set our own standards individually. But I believe that the uh, prosecution team has proven this case by a clear and convincing standard. It's clear to me his tires were off the road. All of the science proves that. They had three different ways they try and do the trajectory of where the car came from. Where was the area of impact? And it was so far to the right, to the north, that it was clear that his tires were 
All four were across the rumble strip. And it was clear that they had been there for more than just a few seconds. It wasn't a brief swerve, because there wasn't any tire marks indicating it was a jerking motion. And so we had been there for at least more than a few seconds. And if he had been doing that, then his driving was reckless. If he had been doing that, he had lost so much uh, control of his driving that he went all four tires off the road. This is beyond distracted driving. This is beyond careless driving. It doesn't matter, and I, I completely agree, at the moment of impact, he was not on his phone. But it's clear that he was on it very much shortly before then. And the Attorney General did not provide to us an explanation of what he was doing. I specifically asked a question to them, because this is what I wanted to know, is why was he so far off the road? How far was he off the road? And all they can say is, they don't know. They had the opportunity to present evidence to rebut this, and they did not. They didn't provide any debating or, or disputing scientific evidence that maybe there's only two lanes, maybe just two tires off the road. They didn't really even try and question it at all. So only left with the investigators' conclusions that, to me, remain unrebutted, that he was four tires off the road. And when you're so far, when you do that for so long that you are so distracted that you don't see the individual in front of you, then you have definitely, in my mind, committed reckless driving. And if you've committed reckless driving, recklessness is a standard for manslaughter. If you recklessly kill another human being, you've committed manslaughter, that's second degree manslaughter in our code. That's a felony, and he would very likely, uh, not, I wouldn't say that, I'm not gonna say very likely, because uh, I've seen manslaughter, second-degree manslaughter cases where people don't go to prison. Because there's a lot of variation in recklessness and degree of culpability. But, he would definitely be charged with a felony. Now, in this case, the prosecutors didn't do that. I'm not going to second-guess their particular prosecutorial decision. Because they have a different standard. They're in criminal court. They had to explain what he was doing off the road, which we, they can't necessarily do or how far, or why he was on there for so long, what he was doing at the moment of the impact that distracted him. Maybe they felt there was enough question that they couldn't present it to a jury and prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not going to second-guess them on that question. But to me, the evidence presented here today is clear that he was. And he was there for so long that, is, that there could be no question that he was driving recklessly. And so to me, he committed manslaughter. That is a crime. Then that gets to my, my final question, is, is whatever he committed worthy of being impeached, worthy of being removed from office? If this was just a class two misdemeanor, if it was just careless driving or just an illegal lane change, there was nothing more involved, I would not find that to be a removable offense. Speeding is a class two misdemeanor, it's not a removable offense. That's not what he did here today. Or that's not what he did that we are judging today. We today have seen that that careless driving actually rose to the level of recklessness, actually rose to the level of manslaughter. And so we must send the signal to everybody that if you drive recklessly on a road and kill somebody, you can no longer be an official in the state. And so... I ask the members of this body to sustain the article of impeachment sent to us by the House because they have, it has been proven to us by the law and the evidence that a, sustain, a sustaining vote is the only vote that should result. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Duhamel. Thank you, Mr. President. All four wheels across the rumple strips, so distracted he did not know what he hit. So reckless. Clear, convincing, direct evidence. This is a serious offense that killed a man. I will vote to sustain the articles of impeachment.
Further remarks? Senator Dietrich. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, the fellow members of the bar for them sharing their you know, expertise and information on this, and I'm not going to be redundant on it. I just simply want Senator, to say. Senator, could you try and get a little closer to your microphone? I just wanted to say that uh, I agree with our the good senators from Lawrence County and Beadle and Kingsbury and Clay and Turner County as to Article 1 and how they look at that and the information they've shared with us. And I think that topic has probably been well explained. We've had uh, excellent information from the investigators today and the reports that we've all had access, the hours and hours and hours that I know uh, all, everybody looked at and we took this job very seriously. I think a really important thing to me is the fitness for office. And for our chief law enforcement officer in the state to conduct himself in the manner that occurred before and after, more importantly, after the accident in his dealings with law enforcement and his uh, calls to 911 and to his referencing himself using the letterhead of the state and his office uh, to make political statements essentially. Uh, those things have eroded and caused the loss of confidence in our chief law enforcement officer by law enforcement throughout the state and probably a lot of the public that we don't know. Uh, we can't, can't really quantify that. But I think that, that it is up to us to, and it's appropriate for us to make a determination as to the qualifications and the performance of our constitutional officers and when we have the opportunity based on tragedies that may occur from the way they conduct themselves. And so it's, it's the matter of the driving and the distraction and leaving the road is just so well settled. The other part that's really important to keep the public trust in the state of South Dakota and our law enforcement in South Dakota is to ensure that we have the appropriate chief law enforcement. And I think that this is an opportunity to make that statement clear for future generations. And so I urge you to vote to sustain number two. Further remarks? Hearing, hearing no further remarks, the question before the Senate. Shall the Senate sustain the first article of impeachment, crimes causing the death of Joseph Beaver against Attorney General Jason Roundsburg, and remove him from the office of Attorney General? Members in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, nay. This is a two-thirds majority vote. The Secretary will please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Yes. Breitling. Yes. Kamak. Aye. Castleberry. Aye. Crabtree. Kurd? Aye. Diedrich? Aye. Duhamel? Aye. Duvall? Aye. Foster? Excused? Freimuller? Excused? Greenfield? No. Heinert? Aye. Hanoff? Aye. Johns? Nay. Johnson? Aye. Klum? No. Kolbeck? No. Mahar? Nessaba? Aye. Nordstrup? No. Pardon? No. Otten? Aye. Roll? Aye. Rush? No. Schoenbeck? Aye. Shane Fish? Aye. Smith? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Steinhauer? No. Sutton? Aye. Simmons? Tobin? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Wick? Aye. Thickman? Aye. Mr. President, there are 24 yeas, 9 nays, and 2 excused. The question, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, 
the Attorney General of the State of South Dakota is convicted of the first article of impeachment and removed from the office of Attorney General. We will now take up Article 2. The question before the Senate is, shall the Senate sustain the second article of impeachment, malfeasance in office following the death of Joseph Beaver against Attorney General Jason Roundsburg and remove him from the office of Attorney General? Are there any remarks? Mr. President. Senator Rush. I'm not going to be repetitive on a lot of the things I said before. I voted no on count one, but count two is a different issue on this case. And in respect to count two, I'm concerned about the, whether the attorney general misused his office as attorney general. You know, obviously he's a poor driver. There have been numerous incidents where he's avoided responsibilities for his poor driving by identifying himself as attorney general. In this case, he started out by identifying himself as attorney general and got special treatment as a result. How many other cases have received the use of the sheriff's personal car? How many other car cases have received such an inadequate investigation? How many other cases have had a committee of prosecutors to decide what charges to bring. What really concerns me, though, is the fact that he was consulting with staff at the Attorney General's office about this and how to handle this matter. Uh, the head of the DCI that was involved in it, his chief of staff in the Attorney General's office was involved in that. He consulted DC experts, DCI experts about the cell phone and polygraph. He put out a press release on his AG's office stationery. Although there's the argument that this was not part of his attorney general's office, he made this part of his attorney general's office. He directly involved the attorney general's office in this entire matter. He affected the credibility of the attorney general's office by his conduct. And in that, I believe that in respect to count two, the answer should be yes, and that he should be impeached in this matter. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Johns. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I want us to look at what the elements are in the articles of impeachment. And we're talking about malfeasance. And we're talking about malfeasance while in office. Now, I understand that Law enforcement lost confidence in our attorney general right after the event and the things that did follow. And that that would have been appropriate at the time for him to resign from office, but he decided not to, and that was a decision he's entitled to. You know, when you lose confidence in your elected leaders in, in uh, parliamentary countries, you have a uh, no-confidence vote. Or in South Dakota, if it's a municipal leader, you can have recall elections. In California, they have a recall elections for state officials. We just don't have it here. But we respect the rights of the electors as to the decisions they made and put in office. There's a huge difference when it comes to impeachment. Why haven't we seen it since we've been a state? Because of the fact that we are extremely reluctant to remove someone for office unless they've really committed major, major faux pas or criminal offenses or things where it's truly a misuse of office, where you're using uh, everything that's related to office. And I can understand the arguments just made by the senator from Clay County where he's saying that they made too much of a use of it. but. Uh, then I got to look at when, when it comes to malfeasance and what the South Dakota Supreme Court has said about malfeasance. It says that, the court, first of all, it has to be done in the official capacity, but that's only one element. The next element is it must be done knowingly. A third element is it must be done willfully. And finally, and most importantly, it must be done with an evil or a corrupt motive or purpose. And if you really analyze the evidence, I don't think we have any evidence here that anything he did was done with an e evil or an Im um, um, improper, corrupt uh, purpose. I don't see it. You know, we're asked to draw inferences. 
and inferences can lead to a conclusion, but inferences must be based on evidence, evidence that you're satisfied with, and then it has to be reason that this is something that logically follows. We don't have it here, folks. I think we had a lot of speculation in some of the opinions, and the opinions rendered by one of the witnesses as to whether he thought he was lying or not would never come up in court. The only, the only thing you're entitled to in court when it comes to a, uh, a person's credibility is I can, give a, I can give an opinion as to whether or not uh, they're deemed to be credible within the community or, or, or I can, uh, but it's reputation. It's a reputation for being a false, false falsifier. And I, I just struck, and, and you know, do I approve of what happened? No. I, 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 I like uh, the, the senator from uh, uh, Yank, or uh, um, um, Vermillion, uh, I, 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 I truly think that things have happened that really have demeaned that office. But is it grounds for impeachment? And I have to say no, but, and I understand the majority are gonna go the other way and that's okay, because that's why you have your position and you get paid the big bucks. But my position is legally it's not sustained. So thank you. Further remarks? Senator Duhamel. Thank you, Mr. President. The standard is honesty. As much as anything, this is about an elected official not telling the truth. Law enforcement testified that the Attorney General lied about several things. He said he was not using his phone while driving until they proved that he was. He insisted he was driving in the middle of the road and that he had to wrestle the vehicle to the side. He initially didn't offer that he had asked law enforcement what investigators would find on his phone. An abundance of evidence that the Attorney General misled or lied to law enforcement. The Attorney General has a duty to hold himself to a higher standard of personal and professional conduct. As the Chief Law Officer, the top cop, once you're caught in a lie, how do you ever overcome that? Ever. He lost the faith of law enforcement and the people of South Dakota because of his conduct. Further remarks? Senator Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I'll try and go through a similar analysis as the last one. Uh, I believe this will be a little more brief. The, to me, the question on the law is a little more, is a little more close because of the murky definition of what in office means. I tried to do a lot of research on this and uh, whether it applies to simply exercising, only official exercising of his official duties, and he has to do something there that would apply, or can it mean more broadly to his conduct as an official of the state? And as the prosecution team pointed out, as the attorney general, he has some higher duties than your average official. As an attorney, he has a duty to candor, and as a prosecutor, he has a duty to be a minister of justice. And when you lie to law enforcement, you're violating that duty. When, and I, there's a lot of questions about what happened in terms of what he knew and when he knew it. I don't know all those questions. I don't know all those answers. But I do know that he lied about his cell phone use. That was clearly shown by the evidence. And he minimized that conduct at first and just continued to only uh, admit to evidence as it was presented to him by law enforcement. And so the idea that our chief law enforcement officer could lie to law enforcement, even about a small matter, and still remain our chief law enforcement officer, to me, is untenable. To me, when you are the Attorney General, you have a higher duty in your relation, in all of your interactions with other law enforcement officers. You must always tell the truth. You could have chosen to not have an interview with them at all, and that might have come with other political uh, implications 
but he chose to sit down with that interview and minimize his conduct to such an extent that he lied. And we cannot send the message that our chief law enforcement officer can lie to law enforcement and remain in office. Therefore, I believe that the law and the evidence, again, bring me to vote yes on sustaining this article. Thank you. Further remarks? Any further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate. Shall the Senate sustain that the second article of impeachment, malfeasance in office following the death of Joseph Beaver against Attorney General Jason Roundsburg and remove him from office of Attorney General? Members in favor of that motion, that question will vote aye. Those opposed, nay. This is also a two-thirds majority vote. Secretary will please call the roll. Senator Boland. Yes. Breitling. Yes. Kamak. Castleberry? Aye. Crabtree? Aye. Curd? Aye. Diedrich? Aye. Duhamel? Aye. Duvall? Aye. Foster is excused. Fry Mueller is excused. Greenfield? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Hunoff? Aye. Johns? Nay. Pardon? Nay? No. Johnson? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Mahar? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Nordstrup? No. Otten? Aye. Roll? Aye. Rush? Aye. Schoenbeck? Aye. Shanefish? Aye. Smith? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Steinhauer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Simmons? Aye. Tobin? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Wick? Aye. Sickman? Mr. President, there are 31 yeas, two nays, and two excused. So the question having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, the President declares the Attorney General of South Dakota is convicted of second article of impeachment and removed from the office of Attorney General. Now, as a reminder, uh, members of the Senate, we have two votes on disqualification. We'll have one vote for each of the two articles of impeachment that both passed, starting with Article 1. So the question before the Senate is, shall Jason Roundsburg be disqualified from holding in an, any office of trust or profit under the state as a result of being convicted on the first article in, of impeachment. Are there any remarks? Senator Schoenbeck. I think we're all weary of the uh, culmination of, of these events that have uh, weighed on us, uh, so I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think the result to impeach has to go hand in hand with the message you send about whether that person can ever hold public office again in our state, that yes is the appropriate vote. Thank you. Further remarks? Any further remarks? Hearing no further remarks, the question before the Senate is, shall Senator Roundsburg be disqualified from holding any office of trust or profit under the state. Members in favor vote aye. Those opposed, nay. This is also a two-thirds majority vote. Secretary will call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Breitling. Aye. Kamak. Aye. Castleberry. Aye. Crabtree. Aye. Curd. Aye. Diedrich. Aye. Duhamel. Aye. Duvall. Aye. Foster's excused. Fry Mueller is excused. Greenfield? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Hunoff? Aye. Johns? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Pardon? Aye. Klum? Kobeck? Mahar? Nesaba? Nordstrup? 
Otten? Aye. Roll? Aye. Rush? Aye. Schoenbeck? Aye. Shanefish? Aye. Smith? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Steinhauer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Simmons? Aye. Tobin? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Wick? Aye. Sickman? Aye. Mr. President, there are 33 yeas and two excused. So the question having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, the President declares the Attorney General of the State of South Dakota is disqualified from holding any office of trust or profit under the state as a result of being convicted of the first article of impeachment. On the second article of impeachment, the question before the Senate is, shall R Jason Roundsburg be disqualified from holding any office of trust or profit under the state as a result of being convicted of the second article of impeachment? Are there any remarks? Senator Schoenbeck. Mr. President, members of the body, uh, especially since my seatmate asked me, I'll tell you that uh, we, have, we had no guide or uh, no prior impeachment to draw upon in drafting these. The constitutional provision is in the disjunctive because I thought some people might want to vote one way on the first question and differently on the second question. That's why you have two questions and you have two questions on each article so they stand independently. And I would encourage you to vote again yes on this one. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing no further remarks, the question before the Senate is, shall Jason Roundsburg be disqualified from holding any office of trust or profit under the state as a result of being convicted of the second article of, uh, article of impeachment? Members of favor will vote aye. Those opposed, nay. Also a two-thirds majority vote. Secretary will please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Breitling? Aye. Mack? Aye. Castleberry? Aye. Crabtree? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Diedrich? Aye. Duhamel? Aye. Duvall? Aye. Foster's excused. Fry Mueller is excused. Greenfield? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Hunoff? Aye. Johns? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Plum? Aye. Colbeck? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Nessaba? Aye. Nordstrup? Aye. Otten? Aye. Roll? Aye. Rush? Aye. Schoenbeck? Aye. Shanefish? Aye. Smith? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Steinhauer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Simmons? Aye. Tobin? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Wick? Aye. Sickman? Aye. Mr. President, there are 33 yeas, two excused. So the question, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, the President declares the Attorney General of the State of South Dakota is disqualified from holding any office of trust or profit under the state as a result of being convicted of the second article of impeachment. 